Hello and what is up YouTube? My name is Jacob Toman and today we are answering the question, who was Herman Bovink? If at any point in time you enjoy this discussion and you'd like to see more discussions just like it, you can like, subscribe, and ding the bell to be notified about when future discussions like this go live on your YouTube feed. So who was Herman Bovink? Well, first off, Herman Bovink was a Dutch theologian, professor, and pastor. He was was born December 13th of 1854 and was born in Hoogeven in the Netherlands. If at any point in time I butcher someone's name or mispronunciate something, it's because I'm not a native Dutch speaker. And so if you've got any corrections, you're more than welcome to point those out in the comments down below. Herman Bovink died on July 29th of 1921, which means that he was contemporary of about a period in history that would have included uh, the American Civil War as well as leading up to the end of World War I, right after which he would have passed away. After pastoring for a year, uh, Bovink became a professor at Campen Theological Seminary. He was only a pastor for a year, but by all accounts, his pastoral preaching was most uh, welcome and resoundedly appreciated by all who heard it. He did travel for some period of time inside the Netherlands, uh, preaching at a few different locations, but that was all mostly within the span of about a year uh, before he became professor at Campen Theological Seminary in the Netherlands. Bavink would eventually team up with uh, Abraham Kuyper. Kuyper uh, several different times asked Bovink to come be a part of the Free University in Amsterdam. That was the university where Kuiper taught at as professor of theology. Bovink rebuffed those uh, invitations several times throughout his uh, professional career at Campen Theological Seminary, both for internal uh, political and religious reasons, but eventually he did move over to the Free University in Amsterdam, replacing Kuiper as Kuiper was stepping down and seeking for his own replacement as professor of theology there at the Free University in Amsterdam. Herman Bovink is most known for his writing. What a shock that a theologian and professor would be known for his writing. So he's most well known for writing a massive tome, uh, which this tome right here, you can see just how thick it is. Uh, this is just volume two of his reformed dogmatics. He, this is by far uh, by far and away what he's most known for. If you look him up on Google, you're going to have suggestions for uh, reformed dogmatics as, as being the, the, the thing that's going to come up in your suggestion search for Herman Bovink. It's a four volume set that includes uh, the Prologmena, God and Creation, Sin and Salvation in Christ, and the Holy Spirit and Church and New Creation. So those four volumes are available uh, in multiple different English translations. That's just been, I want to say, over the last 50 or 40 years, uh, recently compiled uh, in the edition that, that I've got, at least, uh, that is put out and uh, was edited by John Bolt uh, and translated by a team of translators led by John Vreed. Again, if I'm mispronunciating any of those names, please point that out down below in the comments. Bovink didn't just write this, though. This was a four-volume set, uh, but he wrote many other things as well. The Doctrine of God, uh, Our Reasonable Faith, uh, Philosophy of Revelation, The Christian Family, The Last Things, and essays, several essays on religion, science, and society. Now, all of these things are noted in our citation here about when they were translated, but then also if they're individually, uh, when they were individually published, the, that date is also included as we were able to find access to it. So he wrote primarily uh, between the early 1900s till the 19 teens. That was primarily when most of his writing took place. Now, a sample of his writing and a bit of his theology is found on page 15 of this work. This is volume two of Herman Bovink's uh, Doctrine of God. And this is just a quick editor's note that I thought was a pretty good summary describing some of the methods uh, as well as thought processes of Bovink. So, in the section on the doctrine of creation in this volume, in chapters 8 through 14, we see the tension repeatedly in Bovink's relentless efforts to understand and <clears throat> find 
where he finds appropriate to affirm, correct, or repudiate modern scientific claims in light of scriptural and Christian teaching. Bavink takes modern philosophy, such as Kant, Schelling, Hegel, Darwin, and the claims of geological and biological science seriously, but never uncritically. His willingness as a theologian to engage modern thought and science seriously is a hallmark of his exemplary work. Though Bavink's theological framework remains a valuable guide for contemporary readers, many of the specific scientific issues he addresses in this volume are dated by his late 19th century context. As Bavink's own work illustrates so well, today's Reformed theologians and scientists learn from his example not by representation, but by fresh address to new and contemporary challenges. So that's just a brief, brief introduction to some of the philosophy, some of the things that Hervink was, tr Her that Herman Bavink, sorry, I combined Herman and Bavink, that Hervink, that Herman Bavink was trying to deal with and wrestle with through his time, where he took the concerns of pragmatists, of philosophers, and of humanists, and put those up against the very uh, doctrinally sound orthodox teaching uh, that scripture is God's inspired word. And then how do these two things rub up against one another? How do these two things inform one another? Where are they in conflict? Where are they actually in unity together? And Bavink takes a stand that is uh, somewhat refreshing even in our contemporary day, where rather than maybe providing satirical or uh, political or identity uh, argumentation against uh, his uh, philosophical uh, opponents, as it were, or philosophical backdrop, uh, he actually seriously deals with the challenges, the evidence, and the proofs that are put forward by various uh, forms of thought that were prevalent during Bavink's day. And these forms of thought are certainly still true today and still prevalent throughout many different humanist uh, views of philosophy and understanding the universe. They wouldn't necessarily, humanists wouldn't necessarily refer to it as religious. We often as Christians would refer, refer to humanist theology as just that, theology or a religious approach to the universe. And Bavink wants to take those things seriously. He doesn't want to make fun of them. He doesn't want to push them aside and say, well, they don't matter because scripture says X, Y, or Z. He wants to take what scripture has has said and put it up against the best of the best of philosophy in humanism and see how the two things will work either again in conflict with one another or in unity together or somewhere along that spectrum. Now continuing on a sampling of Herman Bavink's own writing is found here on page 260 of volume 2. This is him writing about the Holy Trinity, which maybe you've sat in a Sunday school lecture or per potentially have seen various teachings on, let's say, the workings of the Trinity. Nowadays, there are so many different analogies that are uh, present and that are used throughout creation or that are creative presentations about what the, the Holy Spirit, the Son, and God the Father are and how they interact with one another and the nature of their relationship. And Bavink, writing nearly, well, over a hundred years ago now, in Dutch, has put in more eloquent terms a, uh, a, a succinct summary of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and has corrected and helped to shape some of that conversation about the Holy Trinity. So here is his quote from page 260. Though modern philosophy, with its speculation again, brought the Trinitarian dogma into favor, the church and theology generally assumed a reserved attitude towards these philosophical construals of the Trinity. Analogies at best are a posteriori evidences, and even then the mystery of the Trinity must be honored. Scripture alone is the final ground for the doctrine of the Trinity. Analogies have some value since they remind us that the creation itself shows imprints of the triune God. The arguments also have some value in demonstrating that belief in the Trinity is not irrational. Though grace is superior to nature, it is not in conflict with it. The thinking mind situates the doctrine of the Trinity squarely in the full-orbed life of nature and humanity. 
The doctrine of the Trinity makes God known to us as the truly living God over against the cold abstractions of deism and the confusions of pantheism. A doctrine of creation, God related to but not identified with the cosmos, can only be maintained on a Trinitarian basis. In fact, the entire Christian belief system stands or falls with the confession of God's Trinity. It is the core of the Christian faith, the root of all its dogmas, the basic content of the New Covenant. The development of Trinitarian dogma was never primarily a metaphysical question, but a religious one. It is in the doctrine of the Trinity that we feel the heartbeat of God's entire revelation for the redemption of humanity. We are baptized in the name of the triune God, and in that name we find rest for our soul and peace for our conscience. Our God is above us, before us, and within us. That's just a sample of Herman Bavink, and if that doesn't get you excited, if that doesn't at least give you a bit of an insight into the talent and into the gifting of Herman Bavink as a writer, as a thinker, as a author, as a theologian, then I'm not sure if there's another passage that will better put it, just to get you uh, excited about Bavink's work. Now, of course, we've cited several different sources here today as we've been studying on who was Herman Bavink. If you've got any sources or suggestions, you can feel free to make those down below in the comments. I'm sure I've made mistakes throughout this short discussion, so feel free to point those out in the comments as well. And then, of course, down below in the video description, you can click read more in the video description to see various recommendations for books just like this one, The Reformed Dogmatics Volume 2, which, of course, there is a four-book set that's for sale. You can find that on Amazon as well as on several different book selling sites. And of course, there was a wonderful paper uh, that I found that's called Natural Law in the Two Kingdoms and the Thought of Herman Bavink. This was actually a paper delivered by uh, Dr. David Van Drunen back in 2008 uh, at a conference in Grand Rapids. And so that's a wonderful paper uh, to read as well. And that's also linked down below, as well as a Sunday school lesson that was about 45 minutes by Benjamin Richard Richards. It's available on YouTube that you can listen to. It covers in a bit more depth uh, who exactly Herman Bavink was, as well as some of the thoughts and some of both his friends and enemies that he made throughout his lifetime as a pastor, as a professor, and as a theologian. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope today is the day that you've learned something new and something exciting right here on Tome and Stone.